Biblical Inaccuracy and John 3.16 Part 3 An Analysis of the Famous Biblical Verse For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Question The Bible For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3 verse 16 Should you not believe in Jesus to have eternal life? Answer of course, we believe in Jesus for what he was and we do not believe in what he was not. We Muslims believe Jesus was a Messiah, Spirit from God, Word of God, the righteous prophet as well as messenger of God and the son of Virgin Mary. But we do not believe Jesus was the begotten Son of God. The truth of the matter is Apostle John never ever wrote, Jesus was the begotten Son of God. Please obtain a copy of the Gideon Bible from a hotel or motel near you. It is distributed free since 1899, all over the world, by the Gideon Society. In the beginning of this famous Bible, John 3 verse 16 is translated in 26 popular world languages. You may be amazed to discover that in the English translation, the editors have used the traditionally accepted term, His only begotten Son. Whereas, in several other languages the editors have used the term, His unique Son, or His one-of-a-kind Son. In 1992, when I discovered this textual variations, I wrote letters to various universities in North America requesting them to confirm the original Greek term used by John. Below is a copy of the response received from the George Washington University. John 3 verse 16 and John 1 verse 18 each have the word monogenes in Greek. This word ordinarily means, of a single kind. As a result, unique, is a good translation. The reason you sometimes find a translation that renders the word as, only begotten has to do with an ancient heresy within the church. In response to the Arian claim that Jesus was made but not begotten, Jerome, 4th century, translated the Greek term monogenes into Latin as unigenitus, only begotten. Paul B. Duff, April 22, 1992 Professor Duff's response was based upon Anchor Bible, Volume 29, page 13-14. to The Greek term for, begotten, is geneo as found in Matthew 1 verse 2, which John did not use. Hot tip, precise and pertinent. Jesus said to Mary, Go to my brethren, and say to them, I send to my father and your father. John 20 verse 17. This verse demonstrates that the usage of term father was purely metaphorical. As for Jesus being a unique son, he, unlike us, was created without a physical father. John 3 verse 16 of the KJV states, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. The word begotten is omitted from the main text of the RSV and NIV. John 9 verse 35 of the KJV reads, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Yet the RSV and NIV read this as, Dost thou believe on the Son of Man? The word, Son of God. In the Hebrew language, the word, Son of God, was commonly used for the ones who follow the commandments of Almighty God. It is even mentioned in the book of Romans 8 verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. It is further mentioned that Jesus, peace be upon him, said, in Matthew 5 verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Therefore, more certainly all the messengers of God are sons of God. In fact, the Bible stated in Luke 3 verse 38, Adam the son of God, as well as in 12 Samuel 7 14, it referred to David, peace be upon him, as the son of God. Thus, the term, sons of God, does not bring any affiliation with the Lord, our Creator. It simply means one who is righteous person and has faith in Almighty God. However, most Christians overlooked it and claimed blasphemously that Jesus is the begotten Son of God. They quote John 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. But 32 notable scholars from highest eminence backed by 50 plus different denomination have thrown away the word begotten in the Revised Standard Version as fabrication, interpolation, and concoction. In addition to that, the word only begotten must take figurative understanding when it is mentioned in the Bible. For example, Isaac was mentioned as only begotten son of Abraham when he already had a previous son, Ishmael. Therefore, only begotten must have a figurative interpretation. Isaac had become the heir according to the promise of God. God's blessings would come through him. Furthermore, Matthew 28 verse 19, 
was proved from reputed Christian scholars that the Trinitarian formula, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, was interpolated to Matthew's original Hebrew Gospel. And they said it was a lie against Jesus Christ for putting words in the Bible he never said. In John 3 verse 16 AV KJV we read, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This fabrication, begotten, has now been unceremoniously excised by these most eminent of Bible revisers. However, humanity did not have to wait 2,000 years for this revelation. In Miriam, 1988-98 of the Noble Quran we read, The Jews, the Christians and some of the idolaters said, The Merciful has taken a son. You who say this have indeed brought something monstrous. The heavens almost rupture because of this detested statement, the earth almost splits, and the mountains almost fall in ruins. All of this because they have attributed a son to the merciful. Allah is high above that by far. It is not befitting of the merciful to take a son as he is pure of that. There is no angel, human being or jinn in the heavens and earth but that he will come in submission to his Lord on the day of judgment. He has full knowledge of them and has numbered them exactly. Nothing of theirs is hidden from him. Each one of them will come to him on the day of judgment alone, without any helper or any wealth. Those who have faith in Allah, and do righteous actions that Allah is pleased with, Allah will create for them love by his loving them and by making them beloved to his servants. We have made this Quran easy by revealing it in your own language, O Messenger, so that you may bring glad news to those who are mindful by fulfilling my instructions and avoiding my prohibitions and so that you may warn a people who are harsh in disputing and stubborn in accepting the truth. How many communities I have destroyed before your people! Do you perceive a single one of those communities today, or hear any sound from them? What afflicted them may afflict others when Allah gives permission. Miriam, 88-98 The Contradiction in Respect of the Creation of Jesus, Peace Be Upon Him The Christians claim that Jesus is the begotten Son of God and not the created Son. The question is how is one begotten and not created? The fact that Jesus was born ultimately means that he was in need of someone to bring him into existence. It also means that before his birth he was not in existence, and was nothing and so owned nothing. What is clear is that Jesus was a creation from among the creation of Allah and he Allah brought him into existence in a miraculous way as he brought Adam, peace be upon him, into existence without a father and a mother. They not being satisfied with claiming divinity for Jesus they went one step further and claimed that he was the begotten Son of God. The NIV translation of John 3 verse 16 is different from the King James Version. The translators have removed the word begotten and say, One and only, Son. All other translations use, begotten, and the Nicene Creed clearly translates the word, begotten. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3 verse 16 KJV For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3 verse 16 NIV So you see that the word begotten is mentioned in some versions and omitted in others. The question is, is it allowed for someone to add and omit from the words of God? is of course an unequivocal no. How can the book that the Christians hold in their hands be considered the protected words of God when all of these alterations have taken place? And if the changes in question were done at the hands of the scholars of the Christians, then what those who are enemies of Christianity like the Jews must have done is only left to the imagination. In the overspecified category we have such passages as John chapter 6, John 3 verse 16 and the 10th chapter of John. At 641 Jesus says, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. In this chapter, he compares himself to the manna eaten by the Israelites in Moses' time. Quoting scripture he calls the manna, bread out of heaven, Psalm 78 verse 24. The vagueness in this argument is the fact that the Christian has not stated that he intends to make an exact parallel between Jesus and the manna. If one comes from heaven, so does the other. The information he has neglected involves the origin of the manna. Of course it was not prepared in heaven and then transported to earth. According to Numbers 11 9, it came from the same place as the dew. So a thought must be finished. If the Christian maintains that Jesus literally came out of the heaven where God lives, 
he forces a literal meaning from the words while allowing a figurative meaning for the same words in the case of the manna out of heaven. John 3 verse 16 is where the Christian says Jesus claims status as not just a figurative son of God but as God's actual, only begotten, son. Not all Bible translate the passage with this key word because some translators have seen the difficulty this causes. At Hebrews 11 verse 17, the same Greek word is found in the original language. But in this place it refers to Isaac who was at no time, strictly speaking, Abraham's only begotten son. In the case of Isaac the church explains that, only begotten is not to be understood strictly but must be modified. However, no such modification is allowed in the case of John 3 verse 16 when it is over-specified as being literally true. In the tenth chapter of John we read about the Jews trying to stone Jesus and saying that he had made himself equal to God. The Christian agrees with the Jews and overlooks Jesus' reply. He proceeds to tell them that their own scriptures refer to certain evil men as gods. Therefore, he argued that it was even more appropriate that one actually sent by God should be called a son of God. He had also said that it was appropriate to call a peacemaker a son of God, Matthew 5 verse 9. The Jews and Christians overspecify his words when they insist that he has claimed divinity. There is another poorly conceived argument which is related to this. Where the Jews have understood Jesus to blaspheme i.e. claim divine authority the Christian says he has proof that Jesus did claim divinity. The incorrect assumption, however, is that the Jews understood Jesus. For example, they understood him to seize divine authority when he told a man that his sins were forgiven, Mark 2. But the verse at John 12 verse 49, among others, shows that Jesus denied any personal initiative. He spoke only what God commanded him to say. Own 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This verse is arguably the most famous verse of the Bible and has been translated into more than 1,100 languages. It is considered to contain the central message of the Gospel. In context, there is actually nothing extraordinary about John 3 verse 16. A dialogue took place between Jesus and a Pharisee Jewish leader, by the name of Nicodemus, see John 3 verses 1 to 21. The problem is the quoting out of context. One night, Nicodemus came to Jesus and confessed to him that he, Jesus, was sent by God, because of his miracles. Then Jesus answered him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3 verse 3 Meaning, faith should be generated from above, heaven. And when a person beheld the heavenly truth, he would be as if born again. Nicodemus did not understand Jesus' words. So he asked, How can an old man be born again? He cannot enter his mother's womb and be born a second time. John 3 verse 4 So Jesus explained that he did not mean a physical rebirth, but a spiritual one. The human being be born again, spiritual birth, by knowing the truth that came with the heavenly inspiration, the spirit, and grasping it. So, unless a person is spiritually reborn, he will not recognize the truth of the divine. The spiritual rebirth can be physically seen through the effects of good deeds and behaviors, just as the wind can be seen by the effect of its blowing and sound, John 3 verses 5 to 8. But still Nicodemus did not comprehend Jesus' answers. He said, How can this be? John 3 verse 9. Jesus, surprised, exclaimed, You are a great teacher in Israel, and you do not know this? John 3 verse 10. Then Jesus criticized the Jews' ignorance and hard-heartedness, saying, I am telling you the truth, we speak of what we know, and report what we have seen. Yet none of you, O Jews, is willing to accept our message. You do not believe me when I tell you about the earthly things. How will you ever believe me then when I tell you about the heavenly, spiritual, things? John 3 verses 11 to 12 Then he confirmed in John 3 verse 13 his connection to heaven. In other words, he did not appoint himself to the people but he was the gift of heaven to them. For he shall be lifted up spiritually in a high rank among them, to free them from their wickedness and bring them out of the darkness to the light. The problem was Nicodemus could not grasp what Jesus was saying. So, to solve this problem, Jesus employed another technique. He reminded Nicodemus about the Old Testament story of the earlier Jews with Moses, Numbers 21,5-9, a story that Nicodemus was surely aware of and understood. Numbers 21 5-9 tells of how the Jews complained to Moses, saying, 
Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in this desert, where there is no food or water? We cannot stand any more of this miserable food. So God sent poisonous snakes among the people as punishment. Many of them were bitten and died. The Jews then came to Moses and confessed that they had sinned with their disobedience, and asked Moses to pray to God to take the snakes away. So he prayed for them. Then God had mercy on them, and gave to Moses the prescription for healing by faith. Then God told Moses to make a metal snake and put it on a pole, so that anyone who was bitten could look at it and be healed. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who had been bitten would look at the bronze snake and be healed. Thus, Jesus drew a parable between his mission and that of Moses before him. In both cases God covered the Jews with his mercy and love, but in both cases, the Jews were ungrateful and recalcitrant. Jesus explained to Nicodemus, As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. John 3 verse 14 It was not the bronze snake that healed the ancient Jews, but by their faith that God would heal them by looking at the lifted bronze snake. Jesus in his discussion with Nicodemus used the story of the Jews of Moses' time to prove to him that he was also a symbol of the heavenly mercy and love. And he would be also the solution for the sinning Jews of his time. Jesus said to him, Whoever, of later lust should not perish but have eternal life. John 3 verse 15 Jews, believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3 verse 15 Now the question to be asked is this, was Jesus telling Nicodemus that he would be lifted up physically for many years among the later Jews, just like the bronze snake? Surely not. 1. Although why God would instruct Moses to make a statue of a snake after he had revealed to that same prophet. You do not sin by making for yourself a carved image in the form of any figure. Do not sin by making a carved image in the form of anything. Deuteronomy 4 verses 16 to 18, 25, does not quite make sense. And was he informing Nicodemus that he would also be as the lifted brown snake that the later Jews should look at him while he is lifted up? Surely not. If the brown snake was lifted up on a pole in the desert as a symbol for the sin of the ancient Jews, and it can be easily distinguished, realized and viewed. By the bitten ones even from a far distance, so would Jesus be lifted up physically also as a symbol for the sin of the later Jews just as the bronze snake? Surely not. If the healing from the bite of the real snakes was by a symbol of the same illness, the snakes, was Jesus also the same illness just like the bronze snake? Surely not. So what type of lifting up Jesus was talking about? And how can he be easily distinguished and realized by the later Jews? Surely the apparent meaning of the story of the bronze snake does not befit Jesus, that he would be lifted up physically for years among the later Jews. Otherwise he would also be a symbol of sin as the bronze snake was. Rather, Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus that just as Moses lifted up the snake on a pole as a mercy from God, to heal and save from death any bitten Jew who had looked at the bronze snake with faith, for the same mission with the later Jews, Jesus would also be lifted up spiritually in a high rank among them in terms of prophethood, honor signs, the gospel and the support of the Holy Spirit. And the light that he brought with him to free them from their wickedness and bring them out of the darkness to the light. He was just a mercy from God to get them out of the darkness and heal them from their sin when they had deviated from the teachings of Moses and other prophets. So, any later Jew who had faith in Jesus would not perish but have eternal life. Why did God lift up Jesus in a high rank among the later Jews? The answer is John 3 colon 16. For God so loved the Jewish world. He covered them with his mercy by sending the Messiah Jesus to them to bring them out from the darkness into the light. He wanted their salvation, not their condemnation, John 3 verse 17, because his mercy precedes his wrath. For God so loved the Jewish world that he sent to them his chosen servant, Jesus, that any Jew who believes in him should not perish spiritually but have everlasting life in the hereafter. But he of those Jews, who does not believe is condemned already. John 3 verse 18 So, John 3 verse 16 is a much misused and misunderstood verse. The world, in the context of Jesus' mission is the Jewish world, as we have seen previously. Also, in John 3 verse 19 it says, The light, Jesus, has come into the world but people, the Jews who did not believe in him, love the darkness. And in John 17, 11 Jesus said, I am no longer in the world, 
but they are, the disciples are in the world. Jesus never took his mission to other nations outside the Jewish community, and nor did his faithful disciples. Also, we saw previously in John 6 verse 14, when the Jews saw the miracle of Jesus, they said, Surely this is prophet who was to come into the world. Meaning to us, the Jews. So the world in John 3 verse 16 never meant the entire world or all the nations of the world, but only a certain nation. Such a seemingly counterintuitive and restrictive usage of the term, the world, occurs elsewhere in the Bible. For example, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Luke 2 verse 1 All the world, here means all the Roman world, Roman Empire, not those peoples and lands beyond the authority of Rome. The word gave, in John 3 verse 16, means, sent. God also gave Noah, Abraham, and Moses to their nations before Jesus. Jesus, the Aramaic speaker, did not mean the sacrifice and killing. While his son means the chosen servant, close to God, as we have discussed at length previously. And as also has been discussed, Jesus was never the only son of God but he shared that title with several other true prophets of God. As for the word begotten, in the verse, it was never spoken by Jesus and nor did the author of John pen such a word. This is why this word is no longer found in the revised versions of the Bible. It was omitted upon revision by scholars who recognized it as a deliberate interpolation. It was a forgery not found in the earliest of manuscripts. It does not befit the divinity and the majesty of God that he should beget or sire a son, like earthly creatures do. The word whoever, in John 3 verse 16 means whoever believe in Jesus from his nation, the Jews. Did he not say, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the people of Israel? Matthew 15 verse 24 And was he not used to send his disciples with the following instructions? Do not go to any Gentile, non-Jew, territory or any Samaritan towns. Instead, you are to go to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6 